Greetings students and welcome to part 2 of the solution to the finite wave equation using separation of variables. In the last video we separated the partial differential wave equation into two ordinary differential equations or ODEs using a separation constant. We argued in that video that the separation constant could not be positive or zero and that it can only be negative. We're going to discuss that third possibility in this video and complete the solution to our wave PDE. Now when we have a negative constant, we can write that constant as negative lambda squared, since squaring any real number will always give you a positive value, and so a negative of that square will always be negative, which means our separated differential equation will look something like this. We can break up this expression into two separate ordinary differential equations, one in terms of t and the other in terms of x. If we rearrange the equation in t, we'll get the second derivative of capital T with respect to time plus lambda squared c squared times capital T equals zero. If you solve this equation using the very basic rules you learned back in your ODEs class, you find that capital T is just a sum of sines and cosines. Note here that A and B are arbitrary integration constants. Similarly, for the ODE involving capital X, we have the second derivative of capital X with respect to X plus lambda squared capital X equals zero, which means that once again the solution capital X is a sum of sines and cosines. C cosine lambda x plus D sine lambda x, where C and D are again arbitrary constants. Now because the solution to our overall PDE is the product of capital T and capital X, based on the fact that we've separated the variables, we can write U down as the following. Let's now expand this equation, keeping in mind that a constant times another constant is still a constant, and when we do that we end up with this, where c1, c2, c3, and c4 are constants created from multiplying ac, ad, bc, and bd respectively. Obviously we aren't done yet, we still need to find the values of these constants by applying the boundary and initial conditions. There are five unknowns here, c1 to c4 and lambda, and there's two boundary conditions and two initial conditions that help us calculate those unknowns. I've rewritten those auxiliary conditions, the boundary and initial conditions here, to make things easier. Let's supply the simplest boundary condition first. When x is 0, u is also 0. If we do that, the cosines in x become 1, because cosine 0 is 1. In addition, the sines in x cancel out, because the sine of 0 is 0, leaving us with the following equation. Now, time is a continuous real number going from 0 to infinity, so the only way to guarantee that the sum of cosine lambda ct and sine lambda ct is 0 for all possible values of time is to have both c1 and c3 equal to 0. Let me go on the side and illustrate why this is the case. If I copy paste this boundary condition equation here, and if I suppose that c1 and c3 are non-zero, then I can actually divide both sides by cosine and obtain this equation in terms of the tangent of lambda ct. After all, sine over cosine is basically tangent. This means that if I isolate the tangent, I get the tangent of lambda ct equals negative c1 over c3. Now the constant c1 and c3 are fixed numbers, they don't vary with time or position. However, the tangent of lambda ct constantly changes with time, so there's no way for me to guarantee that this tangent remains constant. No matter what value of lambda c1 or c3 I have, I cannot guarantee the tangent to be fixed with time, so the only possible solution to this boundary condition is to actually have both c1 and c3 equal zero. Now with that out of the way, this is what we're left with for you once we use the fact that c1 and c3 are zero. To make things easier, I'll take the sine lambda x common from the right hand side, and in addition I'll replace the constants c2 and c4 with small a and b. Now let's apply our second boundary condition, so when x is l, u is also zero. Once again, we cannot guarantee the cosines and sines in time to always add to zero for all values of time, so that means the only possible option is that sine of lambda L is zero. Now when is sine of something zero? Well, from basic trigonometry, you know that sine is zero whenever we're taking the sine of an integer multiple of pi, because sine pi is zero, sine two pi is zero, and so on. It follows then that lambda L equals n times pi, where n is a positive integer. Because there are multiple possible solutions for lambda, since I can effectively pick any positive integer I want, I'm going to write lambda with the subscript n to show the value of n that particular lambda corresponds to. Notice that I'm excluding n equals 0 because we said earlier that lambda can't be 0.
Notice also that I could pick any positive integer I want for n, and that would satisfy the PDE and the two boundary conditions. In fact, I could also pick any value of the constants a n and b n, and I would still satisfy the PDE and the two boundary conditions, as long as I keep my n a positive integer. As a result, I have an infinite set of solutions that successfully satisfy the PDE and the two boundary conditions. Because the PDE and the boundary conditions are all linear and homogeneous, what I can do is I can write my general solution as a linear combination of this infinite set of individual solutions. So overall, I will find that my u of x comma t is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n times the cosine of lambda sub n times c times t plus b sub n times the sine of lambda times c times t, all of this multiplying sine of lambda sub n times x, where the a n's and b n's are just coefficients. The uniqueness to this linear combination of an infinite set of solutions comes with applying the initial conditions, which allows us to find values for the coefficients a sub n and b sub n. But before I do that, let's take a short detour. Remember near the start of the video how we were solving for the function capital X? Well, this is the ODE that we were solving, and these are the two boundary conditions we had on the spatial variable X. This might not look like much, but if you remember one of my earlier videos, it looks a lot like a Sturm-Liouville problem. So let's recall the Sturm-Liouville theorem, which says that if I have a second order ODE that can be written in the form of a Sturm-Liouville equation with these two linear homogeneous boundary conditions, then the solution to that boundary value problem for different values of the constant alpha obey an orthogonality relation given by this integral. Let's compare the assumptions of the Sturm-Liouville theorem to what we had when solving for capital X in our separation of variables method. First, we need to check whether the equation we were solving can be considered a Sturm-Liouville equation, and I encourage you to verify that this ODE is indeed a Sturm-Liouville equation with p of x equal to 1, q of x equal to 0, r of x equal to 1, and alpha equal to lambda squared. So that part's checked. Now what about the boundary conditions? Do we have a Sturm-Liouville problem with the boundary conditions taken into account? Well, yes, because the boundary conditions for our ODE are both linear and homogeneous, just like the boundary conditions required for the Sturm-Liouville theorem. And this is why the method of separation of variables requires linear homogeneous boundary conditions, because eventually we want to apply the Sturm-Liouville theorem. Anyway, when we solved this ODE for capital X, we got solutions of this form, sine of lambda sub n times x. There was also a cosine there, but that was removed because of our boundary conditions. Now this solution, capital X sub n, corresponds to a particular value of lambda, which is the eigenvalue that I'll call, of lambda sub n. Specifically, the eigenvalue is lambda sub n squared, but it doesn't really matter since they're directly related. It's possible to write now another solution, capital X sub m, that now corresponds to a different eigenvalue, lambda sub m. Since we now have two solutions to the Sturm-Liouville problem for two different eigenvalues, lambda sub n and lambda sub m, we can apply the Sturm-Liouville theorem to say that these two solutions are orthogonal on the interval from 0 to L. And this is what I mean when I say they're orthogonal. This integral of their product with the weighting function r of x is 0. So if we now plug in our weighting function r of x and our two solutions x sub m and x sub n, we get the following integral relation after applying the Sturm-Liouville theorem. Now this might have been obvious to you if you already encountered this relation in integral calculus, but I went over Sturm-Liouville anyway because at some point you're going to encounter more complicated problems where an orthogonality relation isn't immediately obvious and requires application of the Sturm-Liouville theorem. I mean, you can look those integrals up always, but if you're solving from scratch, the Sturm-Liouville theorem is usually the way to go. Anyway, let's go back to our PDE solution, and let's go apply the initial conditions. The first initial condition states that when t is 0, u is u0 of x. The cosine of 0 is 1, and the sine of 0 is 0, so that means u0 of x equals the following summation. And this is where the orthogonality relation from the Sturm-Liouville theorem comes in. If I multiply both sides by sine of lambda sub m times x and integrate from 0 to L, here's what I end up with. Since the integral of the sum of multiple functions is the sum of their integrals, we can switch the order of integration and summation, in which case our expression simplifies. Now look what happens when n doesn't equal m on the right-hand side. 
Well, when n and m are both different, we can apply the orthogonality relation from the sturm liouville theorem we just derived to conclude that the integral on the right-hand side will be zero. The only time the integral on the right isn't zero is when n and m, our two indices, are both equal, which means that every single term in the summation where n doesn't equal m will cancel out and will only remain when n does equal m. This ends up hugely simplifying our equation so that now we have this. If we now integrate the sine squared term on the right-hand side, we end up with a sub m times l over 2. Now we can isolate our coefficient a sub m to get the following, where a sub m is 2 over l times the integral from 0 to l of sine of lambda sub m times x times u naught of x. Now since the letter I use for my index doesn't really matter, I can take out the m and use an n instead, so that a sub n is given by the following. But we're not quite done yet, because if I go up to my u, I still need to determine the coefficients b sub n. And how do we determine those coefficients? Well, we use the second initial condition, which states that when t is 0, the partial of u with respect to t is v naught of x. To find this partial u partial t, let's bring in our u again and take its partial derivative with respect to t. When we do that, this is what we get. Now we can substitute the initial condition, in which case the a sub n term cancels because sine 0 is 0, while the b sub n term remains because cosine 0 is 1. To find b sub n, we use the same trick we did to find a sub n with the orthogonality relation from sturm liouville Multiply by sine of lambda sub m times x and integrate from 0 to l. Since the process is similar to what we did for a sub n, I leave you guys to do the rest of the algebra and show that b sub n is given by the following integral. So finally, finally, we can write down the general solution to our PDE problem that we started working on in the previous episode. Of course, I've scrolled up because I don't have very much space left on my blackboard. Now, this is the general solution for u, our function of interest, with lambda being n pi over l and the coefficients a sub n and b sub n given by these two integrals. So that does it. We have now solved a wave equation on a finite domain. If I draw out the solutions to the finite wave equation, then we find that there are special waves called standing waves, and every value of n corresponds to a particular standing wave called the nth harmonic. So, for example, if I use the n equals 1 term in the summation, then I get a standing wave u1, which is the first harmonic. If I use n equals 2, I get the second harmonic, and so on. Generally, a full standing wave solution is a superposition of these harmonics, and the superposition is weighted by the ANs and BNs, which depend on the initial conditions. Now, sometimes you might be curious about what this constant C means in this solution. When we previously solved the wave equation for an infinite domain, the C was basically the speed of the propagating wave. It represented how quickly the wave moved in that medium. But in this situation, we've got a standing wave. The wave is stuck between two points, it can't really move. In this case, c takes on a slightly different meaning. It represents the speed at which the wave oscillates from top to bottom. So for instance, the wave might start out like this. I've only drawn the first harmonic here, but the logic applies to the other harmonics too. So the wave might start out like this, but then after a certain period of time it might be flipped like this. The speed at which that wave goes from this upward orientation to this flipped orientation is basically represented by the constant c. So if you've got access to a graphing program like MATLAB, you can probably graph this as a function of time yourself and see how it changes. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.